record. Okay, great. Uh, welcome everyone to our RGS um, IBG uh, GI Science webinar. Uh, my name is Andra Balator. I'll be hosting today um, a contribution by Anita Grazer, who um, is a great pleasure to have here with us. And uh, she uh, she's working at the Austrian uh, Institute of Technology, and she um, she's a very active GI scientist. And uh, I'll, I'll share her website too uh, now. There you go. And you can see the range of things uh, in which uh, Anita has been involved over the past few years. And we were discussing earlier that this work, the, the work that she will be presenting today is only a, a fraction of what she does. And uh, one of my favorite things by, um, by Anita is the uh, QGIS uh, cartography uh, textbook that uh, she developed and I, I highly recommend that for anybody who likes making beautiful beautiful maps and also um, uh, she's very active in open source um, uh, tools and technologies and uh, so I, I'm really delighted to um, have her today and she will be talking about exploratory analysis of mass massive movement data as usual, uh, the, uh, the seminar is being recorded and we'll make the video available uh, later. And um, uh, the talk will be about um, 35, uh, 40 minutes. And we, we will be using the chat uh, for, uh, for the Q&A. So uh, please hold, um, uh, withhold your uh, questions until, until the Q&A. And then I'll be monitoring the chat and, um, and uh, Anita will be taking questions. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome Anita to our webinar. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for the introduction and for having me and giving me this opportunity to share with you uh, my research in exploratory analysis for massive movement data. As you said correctly, that's only one of the topics that I'm working on. Um, but basically, what you will be hearing today is me testing my argument for my dissertation here with you. So that's um, part of my dissertation work that you're seeing today. I want to put this whole topic into a broader perspective, and I'm coming to this uh, field of movement data analysis and exploratory movement data analysis with a background in GI science and geomatics. That's what I originally studied. But uh, geographic data science, as it's now been defined over the last couple of years, is this marriage of big data and data science, mostly derived from computer science, maths, and statistics on the one hand side, and on the other hand side, this geographic uh, GI science, geomatics approaches, or in a more broader sense, quantified uh, geography. But what do we do? It's all about uh, gathering data, massaging it into a tractable form, uh, and making it tell its story so we can present those to others. Lots of the data that we are dealing with uh, includes spatial and often temporal elements, not just if we really talk about geographic data science, but also most of other general uh, data science has spatial and often temporal components to it, even if the analysts don't realize it or don't perform any specialized analysis on these aspects. What we are trying to do is to turn this uh, big spatial temporal data into insights. Because data, as you certainly know, if you've ever tried to work with, data is not information, data is messy, and you need to understand it to be able to deliver insights. Particularly in movement data science, we um, encounter a lot of opportunistic reuse of data. What does that mean? All the data sources, all the big data sources that are available, um, are to a certain level black boxes. And we quite often get access to data that we did not collect ourselves. Nobody designed a perfect experiment and collected data from this experiment. Uh, on the contrary, we try to 
uh, scrape this information from social media or we contact uh, phone network providers or app developers and get data from them. We don't exactly know how it was collected. We don't exactly know how it has been pre-processed. Other data sources uh, that are quite often used are vehicle tracking systems. Obviously, those were never meant to be the data providers for scientific um, discovery. They were meant for some operative um, improvements of logistics application, for example. But since the data appears useful, we try to derive insights from that. Same with Wi-Fi tracking or check-in data and pa even payment data has a spatial component if you can georeference the individual payments of an individual. So all this data, irrespective from where you do uh, get access to it, that it always has a black box uh, component or the data collection is undocumented. Uh, even if it's documented, the metadata is never incomplete because it cannot be no right perfect documentation for any future use case. It's just not feasible. So we have to learn how to work with this biased and messy data. And we, we have to accept that and we need to learn to understand what are the causes of bias. For example, which groups are represented, which are overrepresented, underrepresented in our data set. We need to understand the consequences of using this data in our analysis. So we need tools that allow us to gain an understanding and to um, at least estimate the consequences of using the data for a particular analysis. And what you can see on the right hand side is how this process of data exploration and data analysis is at the center of this data science circle that goes from data collection, data processing to confirmatory data analysis and reports. That's the idealized world. But in the middle, you need this data exploration. You need this cross check. Am I still on the right path? Is the data I'm trying to use appropriate? Um, am I running into problems? Do I need to clean data? That's exactly the challenge that exploratory analysis tries to address. And there is already for quite a few years, a lot of literature on exploratory data analysis, particularly for movement data. Um, what makes movement data so interesting or complex is that you have a lot of different spatial temporal phenomena, interactions between individuals, between indi uh, individuals and their geographic context. You have spatial uncertainty, depending on which system you use to collect the data. You have temporal uncertainty, and you have uncertainty in all the other data attributes that are being collected. And as a result of this complex uh, setup, there is currently still a lack of established tools or even practices for how you should address this data analysis. How should you get from the first contact with a certain data set to being somewhat certain that what you're trying to achieve with this data set is going to lead to valid interpretation of the real phenomenon. Um, obviously, in the literature, you will find a lot of different approaches for how uh, you can address this data, how you can visualize it to gain a better understanding. Uh, one great example are uh, space-time density of trajectories. Um, which give you a, a spatial and a temporal um, impression of the data. And they are very popular, particularly for unconstrained movement data. That's the one where you don't have an underlying network which you could use to generalize on. In a similar way, as the example in the middle, where you have flows, um, directional flows in a uh, city or in an area that you use to aggregate the data to better understand from where to where movement occurs. And those can be um, like those regional flows in the middle or the origin destination flows that you see on the right where it visualizes the flights between different locations in Europe. I want to particularly talk about examples and applications to maritime movement data today. This relates to the project that I've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, so this is an example of unconstrained movement data, as I already said, that just means that there is no underlying road network or a network of paths that every object has to follow. 
Of course, it's constrained by geography because ships shouldn't go onto land, um, but there is no network component which we could use to aggregate data on. Uh, other interesting uh, properties of maritime movement data are that the properties of individual trips, of individual ships, they vary a lot, particularly regarding their duration. So uh, ships that only operate in a port, for example, or ferries that go from one side to the other, their trips might just be a couple of minutes or maybe an hour, versus uh, the trips of uh, large cargo vessels or tanker vessels, they might take uh, weeks to go from one continent to another. Uh, similarly, the spatial extent varies a lot. It can be just a couple of kilometers uh, of trip length versus really travel between the continents. It's also characterized by a lot of observation gaps. So the data sources that you usually get access to, they are limited to a certain region. Um, and you very rarely get access to global data, even though theoretically that is possible. Uh, even then, um, it will not be complete coverage. There will always be holes in the coverage because it's collected either via landside antennas, this data that is sent out from the ships and then uh, collected by the antennas, or it's collected via satellites. Um, that have a quite coarse uh, revisit frequency, so you will have extended periods of time where you don't cannot observe the ships. Um, additionally, there is a lot of uh, uncertainty related to the information that you do receive, because the ships send out the information um, from the system that is on board. Um, that means that the, the, even the vessel identity can be um, uncertain. If the operators typed in the, the wrong ID for the vessel, you will get um, uh, incorrect information. There are multiple vessels with the same IDs floating around. Um, the timestamps are particularly interesting because it's not always ensured that you get correct timestamps. They are not sent with the location information. The timestamps are only attached when the data is collected on the uh, antenna, on the receiver side. So there's some uncertainty and you can get uh, records in the wrong order, which leads to interesting phenomena as well. So all these things come together for maritime movement data and make this a really interesting example for research. What I'm going to show you in the graphics and in the runtime examples here um, is all based on a data set published by the Danish Maritime Authority. We picked um, data starting in 2017, um, so one year, that's around 4 billion records. They have around 22 attributes. So besides the geographic information, there is a lot of other information like the ship identity, the ship type, the uh, the cargo, the status, all those kinds of things. And uh, the data set contains roughly 90,000 individual vessels that travel in an area of northern Europe and interestingly also the North Atlantic. So the right hand side is the visualization of this data set. Uh, the aggregate, an aggregate of the 4 billion records, and you can see a strong concentration around Denmark. That's the part of the data set that we expected to get. And all the other uh, data points ar around Iceland, Greenland, Canada, uh, it even reaches into the Great Lakes in the US. That, that all came as a surprise, uh, but it's a very welcome surprise because it enables us to also try our approaches on a larger scale, even though it's not quite global. So keep in mind, we're talking about around uh, 10 million records per day here, which we are trying to process and trying to get an understanding of the patterns that are in this data set. The concepts that I want to present today are uh, exploration concepts that are based on aggregation, because obviously we cannot look at all those billion data points. You cannot see anything if you just plot those points. You need to aggregate them in meaningful ways to gain further insight. And we have uh, three main aggregation steps that I want to present today. And I will be starting with what we call movement prototypes. And this is a spatiotemporal grid-based aggregation. 
Um, Grid-based aggregations are something that we see everywhere. Almost every data set, every movement data set has an associated density map that goes with it, often called a heat map. And if we have unconstrained information, uh, movement data, like for example, in the bottom left corner, you see this uh, picture from marine traffic, which also visualizes global ship traffic, then it's, it's a grid. And even if it's network constrained movement, like the Strava example on the upper left corner, then it's aggregated, maybe not on a grid cell, but it's aggregated on a network link. And you get the counts on this link, or you might get the average speeds on this link or in this cell. And you can look at those and maybe get a first impression of the data. But we argue that these density grids or general aggregation grids alone are not good enough. Yes, you might have information about the number of records in a cell. You might get information about the average speed of the movement in the cell, the average direction of movement in the cell. But if you think more about those values and how they can, you can use them to understand the data, you very quickly realize that there are extreme limitations to this approach. And this graphics, which I took from a recent paper of ours, is trying to illustrate that. Um, you have these uh, two main movement flows from the southwest to the northeast, and they cross these four cells of this theoretical raster that I've drawn here. And if you imagine you're aggregating all the records that you find in the lower left raster cell, then you will get mean speeds and uh, mean direction values that are not representative of either one of those flows because it will just be the aggregate of those uh, bidirectional flows, opposing flows. And that does not really help you in understanding what's really going on here. And the same is of course also true for speed if those two directions uh, are traveling in very different speeds. Uh, so what we are proposing is um, to have multiple representative prototypes for each cell. And each of these prototypes describes the movement properties that are happening around it. So on the right hand side, you can see an example of how this will look like. Uh, you can see the cells and each of, of these cells contains up to 10 prototypes. And every prototype describes the location of the records that it aggregates. It describes the speed of the records, so the mean speed and the variance of the speed values. It describes the direction, and it also includes a count. So the count is visualized as the size of the marker symbols that you see in the map. The direction is visualized by the pointy tip of the tear-shaped marker. The speed is visualized by the color of the marker, and the location is uh, obviously very plotted. It. Um, you can also see uh, um, the variance of the di direction, which was an interesting uh, aspect for me when I looked into this data, because it makes it very clear, for example, you can spot the harbors immediately. They are characterized by, of course, low speeds, so the red colors, uh, in combination with um, large direction variants or sigmas. So they have those black eyes in the markers as well. So these are either the, the harbors or the anchoring areas where ships exhibit these particular properties. And on the other hand side, you can also see immediately, even though we only have very local aggregates, you can also see those large blue markers with the very light eyes and those mark the main traffic routes where ships are moving at quite fast speeds. How are these prototypes computed? Um, the the big advantage of all those grid-based approaches is that they are very scalable. Um, every grid cell is independent. If you have a cluster with multiple machines, multiple workers, uh, each one of those machines can calculate uh, aggregates for its batch of data, and in the end, you can uh, put everything together. For example, if you have the counts in every cell and every machine computes uh, the counts for a certain um, data subset, uh, you can in the end just uh, add them up and you will get the total uh, counts. And the same is possible for the prototypes that we implemented. 
And also you don't have to keep everything in memory, you can do it iteratively. So that's what you see in the middle in this flow chart and also in the illustrative example on the right hand side. Whenever you get a new record, you'll check whether it fits. Um, you, you first find the cell in which it belongs. That is easy because you have the coordinates. Then you find, uh, then you look if there's already a prototype that matches. So you calculate the distances to the existing prototypes and check if they exceed a certain um, threshold or not. Um, if they, if you find a matching prototype, you just add the information from this record to the prototype. So you update the number of records that it models. You update the average speed. You update the average direction and also the uh, variance accordingly. Um, if you don't find an appropriate prototype, you create a new one. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have a limit of how many prototypes we allow per cell. So when that limit is reached, we have to find which prototypes are the most similar ones, and then we will merge those together. Um, this step is necessary so that we can control how big the model will be in the end, because it has to be still metal. Um, on the really technical Backside, uh, just, I just want to mention it, I won't go into more detail here, but the whole setup is in such a way that we have a distributed file system, which is the Hadoop distributed file system here in the bottom. That means that we store the data on multiple machines. Um, same uh, redundant, so uh, there is multiple copies of the same data set. This is all managed by Hadoop and an Accumulo database, which is uh, with a GeoMesa extension, which is like if you're familiar with Postgres and PostGIS, so Accumulo and GeoMesa is the same thing in the big data world. And this is our storage part. And with Spark and with Spark SQL, we can do the analysis and that's the language that we use to implement the algorithm that I showed you beforehand. And the graphics that you saw, uh, are the, uh, created in QGIS, and to do that, we publish the um, prototypes from GeoMesa using GeoServer and uh, pull the information via WFS. So Web Feature Service gives us the is the standard that we use to connect to this big data environment to finally be able to create visualizations in uh, GIS. Besides um, visualizing and exploring data, these prototypes also already provide a link to more advanced uh, GeoAI or predictive analytics. Uh, so you can't just look at it and make pretty maps. You can also use it for anomaly detection. So as I said before, when you get a new record, you can check whether this record fits into any of the existing prototypes. And basically, if you find that this record doesn't fit to any of the prototypes, you can say it's unusual. The, the movement behavior that is represented by this uh, record is very unusual. You can flag it as an anomaly and you can decide what to do with it uh, later on. We've also implemented um, trajectory prediction approaches based on the information that is modeled in the pro uh, prototypes. Um, you can imagine that uh, roughly by when you get a new uh, record, so you have the current location of a ship, and then you look into the prototypes around it um, to get information about how, what is the most common movement in this area and how will this ship move forward in the future. If you want to read more about it, uh, I have provided all the links so you can reach out to me and I'll send you copies of the papers for, for looking into that further. But this uh, whole grid-based uh, aggregation is just one of the approaches that we thought. A separate one and uh, is obviously you can also aggregate the individual movement records into trajectories. And there's also a couple of important steps that we have to consider here because the data set is so huge. First of all, um, there's a lot of um, erroneous data a lot of uh, outliers that have to be cleaned. We also have to split the, all the observations at stops and observation gaps. Um, on the left hand side, you just see what happens if you try to do none of those things. If you just connect the records one after the other in chronological order, um, 
you, you get all kinds of outliers. And on the right hand side, you see a somewhat cleaned version of Red Eye already. There's obviously still a couple of issues, but that's part of this ongoing um, evaluation of all the pre-processing steps that you need to do before you can feel um, um, that it's safe to continue working with this data and to start the predictive analytics, for example. So what are the challenges if we want to create trajectories from 4 billion records of movement data? There is no uh, straightforward spatial-temporal binning. So we're in the grid-based example before, it was obvious we had the cells. Those provided a spatial binnings. And we could also temporally bin it, for example, uh, looking at each hour of the day individually, and that would have been totally fine. For the trajectories, we cannot do that in the beginning, because as I mentioned, some of the trips may be weeks long, and others will be just hours long. And we also don't know where the ships will be going. So we have to look at the whole spatial extent. Um, what we have to do is we have to look at each individual ship, and we need to process all its records in chronological order. Um, when we try to do that by just collecting all the records that belong to a ship over the whole year, in many cases, all those co collected records together, they will exceed the available memory. That means you get out of memory errors if you try that. So what you need to do is you need to find an implementation that somehow iteratively goes through the sorted records without ever materializing them all in memory at once. So, and the implementation needs to avoid this out of memory error. And there are a couple of libraries that allow you to do that also in the context of Spark. Um, in the previous example, I failed to mention the, the runtime, uh, the uh, creation of the prototypes for the whole data set takes around 41 minutes. So it's not immediate but also considering the large amount of data they're dealing with 41 minutes, it's not a lot of time. Uh, the trajectory aggregation takes a bit longer. Uh, so for half a year, it takes around one hour to process. And all the numbers that I'm giving you here is really just ballpark numbers, because obviously it uh, depends on the number of machines that you have in your cluster. Um, we did these evaluations at different points in time, so sometimes Right at the beginning, we only had six nodes in our cluster, then we had eight, then we had 10. They all have a bit different specs regarding how much RAM they have and how much processing power. Um, so take those things with a grain of salt, but you get the, the big picture. Uh, it's certainly possible to do multiple iterations of this work on one day, and uh, you don't have to sleep over it every time you change something in the code. Um, if you're interested in the technical details, the paper that goes with this part of the presentation also contains um, some implementation details and Spark snippets that you can have a look at that explain exactly how to do this step uh, with the records without running out of memory. The trajectory information, once you have computed it and you have stored it, of course, you can visualize the trajectories. You can filter them spatially, like I did here on the right. You can see the trips going from Gothenburg to Gibraltar, so rather long trips. Uh, and you can also see, uh, I had a look at the travel times between those two locations. So the chart that is on the left-hand side of the plot shows in, in hours how long it takes to travel from Gothenburg to Gibraltar. And uh, on the one hand side, you have the positive hours around 150 for one direction. And for the other direction, you have to look at the negative values in this chart. And what this does is it provides you a first impression about whether the how difficult it would be to try to predict those. So is there a clear median travel time? I would say, yeah, it's not so hard. You can say it's approximately 150 hours. That's what you could expect as a baseline for this relation. And every algorithm that you try to develop has to try to be better than that. As also what uh, I tried to find out with this plot was whether there would be seasonal variations, so whether summer, winter times, you would get different travel times. Um, but on this relation and also many other that I looked at, there were no seasonal relations, so that's probably something that I would not 
I need to use if I was developing an algorithm for travel time prediction. Other people also did destination prediction because from the data itself, you don't get information about which port a ship is to travel to. But uh, based on where it's coming from and its own properties, you might be able to guess where it's going to. So that would be destination prediction. That's also an active field of study. Once you have the prototypes and you have the trajectories, you can bring those two together. And that's what we did in the third example. We calculated flows between the prototypes. Um, these uh, flows consist of pairs of prototypes, obviously, and we also model the speed and the count on this uh, flow, again, with the distributions of those values as well. Uh, similarly to the other implementations, this is scalable. You can do it in a distributed setup, but the algorithm that you see on the right is not yet suitable for data streams. That means uh, that we um, currently have to do batch processing. First, we have to compute all the prototypes, and once the prototypes are ready, we can compute the flows based on these prototypes. But if you then get new information, this changes the prototypes and the flows. So you have to, again, do all the prototype computation, or you have to at least update the prototypes, and then you have to recalculate all the flows. That's the current uh, situation that we are in. The ideal situation would be that you could update the flows or that you could do it all in one step. But we are not quite there yet. So what we currently do is uh, we start from the greatest trajectories, and then we process each trajectory individually. We look at the records. We find the matching prototypes. Of, and we check if the flows between the uh, consecutive prototypes uh, fit the um, characteristics of this record. So is the direction of movement the same within a certain threshold, obviously? Or So if the heading threshold is exceeded, we have to try a different one. And we always update the flows until the last record is reached. And that takes a while. So this is also a bit more uh, expensive than just doing the prototype calculation. Uh, but it gives us additional information that we can use. For example, here you can see the flow patterns of passenger vessels, so mostly ferries, and on the other hand side, tankers in this region around Gothenburg. And you can see the main lines of the ferry connections on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, besides the main path for the large tankers, that you can see going into the port. You can also see in this red circle an area where there's a jumble of lines, and you can see that the prototype arrows, they point into all kinds of different directions, and this gives us an indication that this is an area where the ships are anchoring. And when you compare that to the nautical chart, you, charts, you will also see that this indeed is an area where ships are anchoring and waiting to continue their journey later on. As I mentioned, we don't just store the counts, so it's not just the strength of the flows that we can look at. We can also look at the speed characteristics of the flow. So here, if you have a dark line, it represents a very fast-moving flow connection, and the lighter lines uh, represent a slower speed. And additionally, the width of the lines here are not the counts, but they do represent the variability of the speeds. So what this helps us identify are areas or um, yeah, uh, spaces in the port where um, fast movement or fast movement and slow movements collide. So whenever you have a very f wide line and high speeds, you know that uh, that's a potentially dangerous area where you probably have to um, be particularly uh, cautious when you travel there, or as an operator of the, the port services, you might have a closer look at what ships are doing there to ensure the safety of the operations in your port. With these flows, uh, besides uh, using them for data exploration, you also have kind of a routing graph that you can work with in predictive analytics and in GeoAI. We've also used it to improve the trajectory prediction. So if you get a status update from a ship with its current position, you can use the flow information to find out 
what's the next most likely location where the ship is going to move. And you can use this to go multiple steps through the graph um, to predict our future uh, movement behaviors as well. So with these three approaches that I have described, um, we have multiple different ways to look at the same data set from the um, spatial temporal bind uh, movement prototypes to the trajectories. And when we bring it all together, we have the flows. These were the, the concepts that I wanted to present to you from working with this data. I also briefly touched on the technology stack that we need to perform these analysis. As you can probably um, guess, this is rather complex setup and the results that I have presented to you today wouldn't have been possible to achieve without my co-authors who are very skilled uh, software architects and who did a lot of the implementation work in Spark to make all these things possible. And also on the statistics side, making sure that we have libraries which can model the distributions of the directions, the speeds, and do this in an incremental way. So big thanks to my co-authors on that one as well. For the future, obviously, we are not nearly at the end. There's still continued need for domain-specific uh, movement exploration tools. Uh, I have listed just some challenges off the top of my mind, which I think are worthwhile to look into in the future. We really need a set of best practices or maybe even tools with checklists that allow us to systematically evaluate data quality. Um, I've tried to do a first step, so I currently have a paper in press that looks into systematic evaluation of data quality uh, for this unconstrained movement data. It's implemented using moving pandas. So that's the Python library that I've been working on on the last year, couple of years. So obviously I had to take a bit of a step back for that. Uh, you won't be able to process 4 billion records with moving pandas and with this um, checklist that I implemented using moving pandas, but you will be able to um, process a couple of million of data points uh, easily with it. Another future challenge certainly is openness and reproducibility. So all the data cleaning that we have to do with those data sets, we should really find ways or we need to find ways to document all the operations that were undertaken on the data. It's not sufficient if you publish the raw data with your journal paper and you say, okay, I used this data, then I did some cleaning and finally those are my results. Uh, that will not cut it because there are so many degrees of freedom in how you might do these cleaning processes and every individual step, like aggregating the trajectories, splitting them based on multiple different rules that you might uh, apply. So we will need to find tools and processes of how to document this to make it reproducible. There are also huge privacy issues and not so much with ship data, but obviously as soon as you have uh, app data or you have mobile network data, Wi-Fi tracking data, payment data, uh, and most of the exploration tools we have right now, they have no built-in privacy protection of any kind. You can look, if you get access to the data, you will see visualizations that very clearly identify individuals um, quite often. So concepts of how we could even uh, integrate privacy protection in those tools are, would be really valuable in the future. And also we need to think even more about how we deal with uncertainty. So it's still not clear how to efficiently evaluate and visualize uncertainty also when you want to communicate with others in your interdisciplinary team who might not be so familiar with cartographic concepts of uh, uncertainty. Uh, you really have to think hard of how to show things not to um, ev evoke a feeling of service simply not in the data. And with that, I'm looking forward to your questions and thank you again for your time. Thanks, Anita. That was a fantastic presentation. I'm sure that there's a virtual applause um, coming through. Um, now the chat is open. So uh, for questions, please use the chat in the, um, in the right hand side of the uh, interface. And I will, be, I will be monitoring the chat and um, reading the questions out loud so that um, 
we can have a good discussion. Yeah, so as we wait for uh, questions to come through, um, so moving, you, you were saying that moving pandas um, is, um, you're, you're not maintaining it right now, or is it just the scale that, that is not scalable to the level of the work you presented? Yeah, with moving pandas, you have to know that uh, pandas data frames, which I'm using um, in moving pandas, they always have to fit into your computer memory. So if you have a data set that does not fit into your computer memory, you're in trouble already. Um, there are uh, workarounds, obviously, but they have not yet reached the, the spatial data libraries. So you probably know that Pandas is the base. It has those data frames which you use for storing the data. Then there's a spatial extension called GeoPandas, which gives us a um, possibility to store geometries with the data set data frames, and I use those geo data frames as a base for, um, for moving pandas. And uh, geo pandas currently does not have the support for distributed processing. One of the libraries uh, that is very promising would be DASK, D-A-S-K, um, oh. that allows you to create data frames that don't have to fit in memory, um, but it doesn't work yet for geo data frames. So I'm oh, waiting for that. Yeah. Um, Excellent. No, that's, that's yeah, yeah. No, that's that's really interesting because I think a lot of people uh, work with data that doesn't really fit in memory. And uh, I also meant to say that it's one of the few uh, talks where people talk about big data while actually doing big data. So and I thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, well, the well, well, the data is actually really big. So we have a few questions coming through, one from uh, Simon Kobler. So what is the size of the cells that you are using? Would a hex grid provide any benefits? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, we obviously tried many different cell resolutions and we even had an approach which uh, created like a pyramid of grids. So you had multiple aggregation levels in the same pyramid. Um, there are advantages to that, obviously, particularly for exploration, but it makes the implementation in, in Spark uh, much more complicated. Um, before we did Spark, we had a, a Java implementation of this um, um, pyramid-based approach, and that was one of the first publications in 2018 where we showed how that would work. Um, but that was limited then to the, to the one big server that we had because it was multi-threaded, but it could not become put onto a cluster with uh, individual machines um, compu uh, computing the uh, individual or co doing the computations together. Um, when we really ended up with those uh, billions of records, we, we decided to move to Spark and had to re-implement the whole thing. And then we let go of the pyramid approach and just picked a resolution level that would work for the application that we had in mind. Uh, and the size of the cells, um, if I remember correctly, is uh, in degrees, 0 0.001 degrees. So that would be 100 by 100 meters, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it could be any other value as well. Uh, your question concerning hex grids. Uh, yes, definitely there are some advantages that we have with hex grids. Um, because they, uh, you don't get these border effects uh, that much. Um, on the other hand side, uh, since we do this, follow this prototype approach, we already have an additional level of flexibility to our aggregation. So if all the locations, all the movement records are part of our cell, then all the prototypes will be also located in this corner of the cell. Um, and we don't force everything to di be distributed evenly over the one single grid cell. So we did not find very strong edge effects. Um, we also had this sensitivity analysis in the paper where we tried with different grid sizes and how that would be affected. And it pretty much uh, confirmed these findings that it's not necessary to uh, make it more complicated by introducing a hexagonal grid. Mm -hmm. 
Great, thanks for that question. We have a lot of interest in the chat. And the next question by Morgan is, uh, how do you deal with data sinks, meaning places where multiple points are snapped to the same coordinates and whether, that's, uh, whether you see that in that kind of trajectory data and whether it's a problem? Mm, I'm trying to think about what exact problem the author is trying to reference. Uh, I think it's when data, uh, when data, um, uh, GPS coordinates are snapped to a certain resolution and, um, and for mm. example, five, five meters and you get a lot of points in the same location when in fact they are. Okay, yeah, indeed that does happen. Um, we found that it depends on the individual ship whether that happens. Uh, in other data sets it will certainly also depend on other processing steps uh, in the pipeline. Uh, so you will probably get that. If it's systematic, uh, it probably makes sense to do a cleaning step beforehand to try to eliminate that or to kind of do an interpolation maybe. Um, for our work, we decided to ignore it because we only found this effect for, for a couple of vessels and the majority of uh, objects did not exhibit this uh, particular problem. But I would certainly have to acknowledge it and in the current implementation, there is no particular intelligence that would deal with this effect. Yeah, great. So next question from Seraphine. Uh, Geo privacy is a real concern with movement data. Can you suggest any preliminary ideas on how it can be addressed? Um, short answer, I don't have any good suggestions. Um, mm -hmm. I have spent a lot of time thinking about it and acknowledging how horribly difficult it is to perform anonymization in a, such a way that you don't render your data completely useless. Uh, we have to be honest that every, every anonymization step that you take renders some certain applications impossible um, because you cannot identify, uh, or you just throw away the information that you would need to do a certain um, to implement a certain algorithm to test a, a certain hypothesis. Uh, recently, I, I watched this talk about differential privacy um, mm. on, um, on uh, census data. And it was fascinating to hear even with the information that they have and the, they, they have to decide beforehand which kind of queries they are going to support and how much information they will di disclose for each one of those individual queries. And once you have run out of a certain budget of information that you are able to disclose without uh, giving up the, the privacy, um, then, then you have to say, stop, we cannot provide any more information that otherwise you will be able to identify individuals again. If we tell you more about uh, the age groups or the income levels or the genders uh, in a certain region. And with the movement and with the information that you can already extract from just a couple of um, visits, for example, from an individual um, at different locations, you can so easily find out who that individual was and probably where they live and how they tick. Um, it's, it's super hard and there are no good solutions out there, I'm afraid. At least not uh, for from the scientist's perspective, where you maybe are still trying to evaluate whether a certain hypothesis even is feasible to be answered. Um, from the user side, from the citizen side, I think um, it's very important that uh, we we protect the privacy, but from a scientist side, I also feel the frustration sometimes with uh, how how limited we are with the, with the data sets that went through this um, processes of, of removing uh, identification. Yeah, absolutely, and it's uh, is it, is I was just curious about the privacy issue for vessels. Is that a, a big concern as well for individual vessels, or is that tends to be more public data that authorities know anyway where vessels are? Um, there's a couple of levels here. So theoretically, anyone can set up an antenna and can receive the information which is broadcast by the vessels. 
So it's certainly not secret in that way. They have to broadcast it because it's uh, safety um, critical information. Um, countries like Denmark obviously consider it's not privacy relevant because they publish this information and you can download it from the FTP server. Mm. Um, countries like the US, the Coast Guard, they also publish the information, but they have uh, anonymized the identifiers of the vessels. So you don't get the original IDs that you can use to Google a vessel to find out which one it was. Um, but otherwise, uh, they also release the information. In, in Austria, for example, on the Danube, uh, ships also have to broadcast this information, um, but the operators of the Danube waterways say it is privacy relevant because a lot of people on those uh, river ships, they actually live on those ships, that's their home. <laughs> uh, and that for them makes it a privacy issue to, to publish this information. Uh, so the answer, as always, is it depends. <laughs> uh, as always. No, thanks for that. It was really fascinating. Actually, a related question by uh, Rahul is uh, about the data that you use. And I think a lot of people in the audience will be interested in exploring similar data. So uh, the question is, what sort of data sets you use for, uh, are used for ship uh, route tracking? And which global data sets would be the best for this purpose? Okay, um, the, the Danish data set, as I said, is publicly available, so is the US data set. Um, I can provide you links, and also if you look into the papers, you will find the links to the, to the download websites. Um, none of them is global. If you want global, you have to get in contact with the likes of marine traffic, so those are commercial companies. Um, they sometimes do collaborate with researchers, but usually you will have to fork over a certain amount of money to get access to the data. Um, part of the reason for that is because they do all the aggregating, they probably do some cleaning, they also have access to satellite uh, ship information, which um, usually you only get the land-based information from the antennas that are on the shore side. So you um, get a lot of information from them, but it's those are commercial data providers. Um, so for, for ships, those are your ways to go. There's even an, a European initiative for, for research. Um, I don't recall the name yet. We tried to get access via them, but they told us that um, the AIT or Austria itself did not qualify for, for data access via that part, path. So I did not follow up on that. Thanks, that's very helpful, and I'm sure that a lot of people um, are taking, taking notes. Uh, a related question about data is about data cleaning, and you mentioned that obviously there's noise and there's uh, invalid trajectories, and a question from Stephen is, um, when uh, cleaning data and discarding invalid records, do you sample the discarded records to check whether uh, the, the, um, you know, the the process has worked correctly, or how do you how do you uh, tackle that problem? That's an excellent question, particularly because there is no clear right or wrong with the results that you generate from this uh, trajectory aggregation. Uh, so what we we decided to do is that we would split the continuous um, tracks whenever we lost contact or lost contact to the ship for a certain amount of time. That might be 15 minutes, that might be one hour. Uh, there's already some degree of freedom here. Um, and also we had to um, discard outliers. So that was, um, in this case, we implement a simple um, filter based on the speed between consecutive records. So if the speed between two records exceeded a plausible threshold, possibility threshold, then, then we discarded um, the, the position and uh, only continues the trajectory with the next um, realistic speed value. And uh, that way, of course, you, you discard some records. Um, the validation of whether the results are correct was um, mostly looking at individual results. So again, the visualization is an important aspect. We checked whether it's plausible what we uh, extracted here. Um, you can look at the maps, you can look at aggregates like uh, 
average speed values that you uh, generate for the trips. Um, you can look into how many trips you create per vessel. Maybe you're splitting a bit too often. Um, but since there is no uh, definite grant truth, there will always be some degree of uncertainty whether you really did the best job that you could have done. Thanks, that's, that's excellent. In the meantime, somebody kindly provided the correct link and name to the uh, Python library that uh, you were talking about. So Dask for scalable data frames, uh, very yes. useful. And one final question uh, from Avinash uh, the, um, about whether there is a, a global ship traffic monitoring system that coordinates uh, the, um, um, the, the routes and uh, minimizing overlaps between ship journeys. And that's also linked to something I was thinking about, whether you can use this data to do forensic work, lo looking at areas that are dangerous, right? As, as people do in aviation, that you, you observe yeah. um, sites of accidents to actually understand what went wrong and whether your technique might, might be um, useful for that. Yeah, so there's a lot we could talk about here. So yes, this data is used for forensics work. It's also used to try to detect uh, illegal phishing, piracy, all kinds of uh, um, behaviors that you don't want besides the, the regular um, vessel traffic. Um, in contrast to aviation, there are no um, vessel planning uh, organizations that could tell a, uh, a ship's captain where they have to go and how they have to travel somewhere. Once you're in international waters, um, they basically can do whatever they please. Um, if you are closer to the shore, there are some certain rules, so you will find that there are like even traffic separation schemes that mean they tell you where you have to travel, where you have to go, and if you want to travel into this harbor, you have to follow these paths. So even though they are not visible when you look at a certain area, they actually have defined paths that you have to follow as a ship's captain. Um, but it's not like in aviation where someone assigns to you a certain flight path and you have to follow that flight path from A to B and you are not supposed to deviate from that. It's more localized. So you have regional regulations, those you have to follow, but in between all kinds of things can happen. And on that note, thanks a lot, Anita, for a fantastic presentation. And a lot of people in the chat are keen to have the slides. They want everything. Uh, so we'll, we'll see whether you want to make, the avail make them available later. And the video, will be uploaded on, on YouTube and made available uh, hopefully later today. And um, again, I invite you to check Anita's um, website and Twitter as she's very active and uh, doing a lot of interesting things. And uh, by the way, this talk, I think, reached breached our record of attendees. It was 124 at some point. So uh, let's thank uh, Anita again for her, her contribution to the, our series. And well, it's a virtual. Thank you for all uh, the questions. Uh, it's a virtual applause. You can actually just like <laughs> applause. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks everyone. And um, thank um, you. you, as usual, uh, you can check our um, website for the uh, next webinars. And thanks everyone for coming.